the difficulty also is, is that you know, some parts of biology are very sensitive to certain yeah. substrates. So for example, this is H2O, I hope, anyway. And um, it's quite similar to D2O. So D2O has a, you know, a, a melting temperature of 3 degrees Celsius instead of 0, and it has a boiling temperature of 101.4 or 0.6 yeah. instead of 100. So it's quite similar. It weighs a little bit more. Yeah. And if I had it here, I could just drink it. But if I drink too much of it, I'll die because it's poisonous. So that would suggest that um, life is extremely fine-tuned to H2O because if I drink D2O, I'll die, right? Even though D2O looks chemically almost the same. And the reason I'll die, I'll die is because the Ds, there's lots of hydrogen-based reactions that happen in my body and the D yeah, slightly that, changes but, those rates. But I could imagine evolution adapting to deuterium uh, yeah. if, if that was... Oh, okay, exactly. In fact, in fact that's, that's a good point. So it turns out that you can take bacteria for whom D2O is poisonous, but if you slowly increase the D2O concentration yeah. and they evolve over time, yeah. they'll eventually evolve until they're very happy in D2O right. and H2O becomes poisonous. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and so that tells me that, that what seems like a fine tuning in biology is actually a historical. A historical yeah. continues to be happened to be yeah. come out here. And so in the possibility spaces, there is a possibility space that if the laws of physics made D2O yeah. the dominant. Um, yeah. uh, uh, liquid, basically, yeah. then but life would probably still be not too different from yeah. life as we currently see yeah. it. But, but, but life needs information storage. It needs something like DNA, and we haven't got anything on the horizon that looks like DNA except perhaps RNA. Yeah. So let's stick with DNA. It's, it's double spiral structure. And I remain, remember being very, very struck reading um, uh, Jim Watson's book, The Double Helix, about this and how they were struggling to find it. And a lot of it was simply questions of bond lengths and bond angles. And if you were to take the spiral around, would it still fit together yeah. or wouldn't it? And how could the base pairs do? And it was a question that the angles had to fit together when you round there. And the lengths between the different base pairs had to be exactly right to make it fit. And that's determined by the underlying physics. And so that's where if you change the underlying physics, it's conceivable that the DNA won't be able to form that spiral structure. Or, or, um, and, and in that case, um, a much more important part of the foundations of modern bi biology is under threat. Yeah. Now, this, I mean, <laughs> the difficulty with these kinds of arguments always is the, you know, the puddle argument, right? So to, to a puddle, right, the shape of the hole that it's in always looks just right because yeah, it fits yeah. in it just perfectly, right? Yeah. And so the question always with something like DNA is, you know, if you change its parameters, maybe, you know, so RNA has slightly different parameters, it's a slightly different helical pitch yeah. um, and it can also act as an information carrier um, and if we change the properties it's just really hard to know right? it, it is I mean so DNA so the question is is DNA is remarkably fine-tuned so if yeah. you change the the bond length then it would no longer function as DNA molecule but is it the same argument as we have for the water yeah. which is that the water becomes poisonous but in fact we could if we change the D2O but if we but evolution could adapt to this new structure, or is it actual real fine tuning? So that it turns out that in the chemical space of possibilities, there is only one molecule that can store information in a stable way, as yeah. DNA does. Yeah. And if there wasn't DNA, there would be no life. It's really hard to know. Right? It is hard to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So maybe I mean, it's never less interesting. It's interesting to think about this for sure. Um, <laughs> is it fruitful? I hope it's fruitful. Yeah. My worry about exporting, so in the classic fine-tuning argument, my worry about this is a little bit like as follows. In the classic fine-tuning arguments, um, like Hoyle's triple alpha and the resonance in carbon, you can change the fine structure constants and you can calculate what happens. And people have actually recently done some uh, QCD calculations to actually look at how the exactly how that that unstable resonant energy level changes as a function of f tweaking these parameters. Yeah. And the great thing about physics is that you can do that. You can do the counterfactual argument. You know what's happening. But now I say I'm going to change some physical parameter and my chemistry changes. Then what happens to that possibility space? Well, it's really, really hard to know. I just can't make those predictions. Can, can we step back a minute? Would you agree that carbon is necessary for life, or would you doubt that? Well, so I think. 
carbon is definitely necessary for carbon-based life. <laughs> yeah, that's a tautology. Tautology, exactly. <laughs> but um, and carbon is a very remarkable molecule. So maybe, uh, well, I think what you're saying is something like, carbon is genuinely a remarkable molecule in its kind of chemical fruitfulness and the variety of things that it can do. Yeah. And so it's almost certainly the case that, in order to have something like life, whatever that actually is, you need an underlying chemistry that's sufficiently fruitful and varied that it can perform the, the, the variety of functions that are needed to make inter life interesting. Yeah. And carbon seems to fulfill that, that property, and it's not so clear that any other element does that currently. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to know. And silicon may be, and people think maybe it could be silicon-based life. Uh, but so, so, it is, so but the point is that it's, like, it's a puddle argument a little bit, is that we see life as it currently is, and clearly it's, it's very heavily dependent on carbon and on carbon's incredible chemical flexibility and fruitfulness. Yeah. But could there be another completely different form of life which is based on some other kind of chemistry, maybe on more than one element? Uh, right? Maybe on? Maybe on more than one element, right? On a, on a, right? It's really hard to know. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to know. And I think given that we can't do the counterfactuals even for the life that we know, it's really hard to make any kind of firm counterfactual arguments. Oh. For the life that we don't know. Well, what, what you can do is vary in your mind, yeah. vary counterfactually, various of the constants of physics, like the cosmological constant, like the fine structure constant, the, the proton neutron mass difference, and so on, and see whether, on the one hand, you will get planets and yeah. stars which provide a habitat for life, and on the other hand, get uh, molecules, atoms and molecules, which could be put together to form life. And th th that's a level of generality at which you're not plumping specifically for carbon, yeah. but you're just saying atoms must exist. Yeah, exactly. So the classic fine-tuning arguments, you know, you, it turns out that very small changes in the physical constants that we have will end up not generating a chemistry that's rich enough yeah. for life. And it turns out that you don't need to change those constants very much for you to end up with universes that are very unlikely to have life. Yeah. But that's somewhat different from the, what we, if you would like to do that argument in biology, um, because the argument would be you, would, you obviously need something like planets for life, something stable, you need certain kind of climate stability probably, and a whole series of, a whole series of things that you need. Um, but let's say you got those, but you had a different chemi chemistry, carbon somehow didn't work. Could you still have life? Right? It's important for exoplanets, right? So could it be that you could have life that's based on methane or on? Oh, that's on carbon. Yeah, okay. that's no. carbon. Okay, oh, yeah. But, you could have, <laughs> but I'm thinking about water, right? So you, we think we need water for life. Could you have no, life based on a different, on a different, um, on ammonia, right? Could you have life that lives in ammonia that's still, you know, something? Well, th that I think might easily be possible because you can extract energy in that context. Yeah. So, so. I wouldn't rule that out. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, some of these extremer files seem to be something rather similar to that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's a good example. So extremophiles, files, bacteria or archaea that are found in this, um, you know, in very hot temperatures or in yeah. very high pressures, baryophiles or halophiles, which are in high salt concentrations. Um, it is remarkable how far life can. But, but it's, it's still carbon-based. It's still carbon, yeah, exactly. It's still carbon. That's, so one question, I think, if we want to answer this question about fine-tuning, it's almost a little bit like if you look at extremophiles and see how far they can go in terms of temperature or salt, yeah. Yeah. that at least tells us for carbon-based life, what, that gives us some indication of what the extremes are yeah. at which life, uh, that life can, can evolve. Yeah. And probably beyond that, at some point, it simply becomes chemical and biologically impossible. So temperatures go too high or too low or salt concentration goes too high or pressure gets too yeah. high, then even bacteria can't no, can no longer adapt. But it may be that under very high pressures and high temperatures, a different chemistry would allow life. Right? I'm not saying it, I can't really see any reason, any way that it would, but it's hard to rule it out. And so, yeah. so actually that reminds me of, um, of a, um, a book that I found extremely Helpful. It's by a, a Evelyn Fock Keller, who was a physicist who moved into biology and now a yeah. philosopher. Yeah. And it's um, uh, 
um, I forget the title, but the subtitle is Models, Metaphors, and Machines. Yeah, I've read it, yeah. And so in the, in the beginning, she has a really fascinating story, which is that she was first moving from physics into biology. And so she was teaching medical students. And so she tried to teach them dimensional analysis, which you know, it's part and parcel of basic undergraduate or even secondary school work. And at some point, one of the students raised his hand and said, excuse me, ma'am, how do you know this is true? Have you done the experiment? <laughs> and she was flabbergasted because you don't need to do an experiment to do dimensional analysis. It's kind of like, it's like logic, right? It's obviously yeah. true. And so she reflected on it further and she said, well, you know, in biology, so much is surprise, so much is unexpected, that there is an enormous distrust, distrust of these kinds of deductive arguments. Yeah. And which have, which have gone very, very wrong in the past. Very wrong in the past. And so I find that when I talk to my biology friends, they're actually quite suspicious of my theoretical arguments, my deductive type arguments. Yeah much more so than physicists would be. And I think for good reason, because science is full of surprises. And so her argument was, well, the student was basically giving that sentiment, saying, you know, how do you know that if you did the experiment, dimensional analysis wouldn't work, right? Because our experience of biology is that it does stuff that we just never anticipated yep. all the time. I agree. That's actually the classic hallmark, I think, of an emergent type science, right? So this emergence is often, it can also be explained in epistemological, certain, like weak emergence is often Epistemological, it's about surprise, it's about the, the whole, the collective doing something that you wouldn't have anticipated by looking at the individual parts. Yeah. And so biology does this all the time. So that sense of surprise is what makes biologists very nervous about the fine-tuning style of argumentation, which is to take a counterfactual and say this couldn't happen, that can't happen. The fact is, like this poor student, um, you say, well, how do you know? Have you done the experiments? Well, in terms of fine-tuning, of course, the answer is you cannot do the experiment. Yeah, and so that, exactly. is, that is an absolute... So that's a big the, problem, the, right? We've, we've got the laws of physics. They are there, and we cannot change exactly. the laws of physics. We can't change the fine structure content, so we can't do the experiment. We can't do the experiment. So I think, <laughs> so I think as a, you know, so this is more of a sociological point rather than... But I think there's a good reason for that suspicious, suspicion of these types of arguments, which is that biology surprises us all the time. So. It's hard to imagine life that's not based on water and carbon and the things that we see. Yeah. But, and if we start thinking about how life could be possible without those things, it just seems very yeah, odd. But, 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 you, but the, problem, the, the worry is always a surprise, right? The worry is that you think it can't work, but yeah. there's going to be a surprise. Okay, but, but what you can do in terms of possibility spaces and so on, you can put down some general criteria. Life has to have some energy source. Sure. It has to have a material source. Sure. It has to get rid of waste material. Sure. If it's going to be life of any interesting type, it's got to have some kind of sensory system. Sure. And it's got to have some kind of method of processing the data coming in from that sensory sure. system. Sure. So th there's a series of things which you can say that you would require of life. And now there's th th that places no restriction on how that can be realized. But then if someone says to me, but life could could life be made of gas? Could you have gaseous life? My answer would be on the basis of what I've just said, no. Because gas can't have a sensory system and it can't have a, a method of processing the information. So I would say if someone says, is, is there life made of just methane and ethane and nothing else? My answer would be no, it could, couldn't come into existence. So, so I, I think you can make some progress. Yeah, that's true. No, no. But, but of course, maybe sometime one of these biologists will do an experiment and say, but look, there it is. There it is yeah. <laughs> I'll have to. <laughs> I'll have to change your own. But yeah, it seems unlikely. I mean, this is why I think experiments that try to make very, you know, try to reproduce the origin of life or make, you know, there's experiments where you try to make the simplest possible bacteria by knocking out genes, yeah. like Craig Venter is doing. These are really important because they're trying, they do help us get some indication of what the minimum needs. Yeah. So clearly, you need some, it seems like you need some kind of encapsulation system so that you encapsulate things. You've got to encapsulate it, but then you've got to get... Yeah, to get some kind of metabolism and replication. You've got to get metabolism and replication, and there's this huge debate which yeah. comes first or do they come together, metabolism or replication. But for me, the key point about this, you, you can, I know you're looking at self-assembly, and, and self-assembly can get 
to very very interesting stuff and you can get sand piles and you can get you can get these um, closed systems you can get simple organic molecules but in order that you get life what you have to have is eventually the system has to start adapting to the environment in order to adapt to environment information must flow from the environment into the system and alter either its structure or its behavior or both. In other words, top-down causation must come into action, otherwise life can't exist. And that's, that, that I'm very strong on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, yeah, strong. Yeah, exactly. Of course. <laughs> strong emotions. Yeah, so I think that is inevitably the case. So even if you want to make a self-assembled system that's going to be lifelike, it needs to be able to process information. And it has and, to... And so has, there is going to be a top-down causation which comes from the environment having impact on it. Yes, it has to have in some sense a record of the environment and its internal structure. Yeah. And in a sense, we've got a record in our DNA of not j just our current environment, our past yeah. environment. Yeah. And so we've got a record of what the environment was which acted top-down to structure the DNA, which because that's what it is. And so... And so, I mean, it is in principle possible to make self-assembled systems that then respond to the environment and rearrange themselves in response to the environment. It's one of the, the kind of big goals of, of our work is to try to figure out how you could do that. So you can make things, we look at making things out of DNA um, that can then respond to yeah. environmental things and change stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it can change and it'll open or close. And you can imagine making more complicated versions yeah. of that that then trigger you know, some environmental stimulus triggers a whole cascade of reaction on the inside and you could change what you, what you have. Okay. The idea would be that's why you, why you, you like to use these things in medicine, for example, right? So I can make a little nano robot out of DNA that I, I inject into you and then it finds a cancer cell and it, it latches up on the cancer cell and then changes itself into some kind of poison. That would be great, right? Um, and that is, I guess, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but that is incorporating. The minute we start thinking about having the environment interact with the self-assembled system, it's a top-down yeah. causation yeah, that's yeah. happening. But, uh, actually, uh, to, uh, adaptive selection is an incredibly powerful principle, yeah. and it doesn't apply just to evolutionary history. Well, the basic idea is you've got an ensemble of incoming stuff, and there's a gate with a selection principle, and you only let through the stuff which satisfies your yeah. selection yeah. principle. And this is how you create an order ensemble out of a disordered one. It's yeah. by selecting what yeah. you let through, and then the other stuff stays behind. Yeah. And there are all sorts of examples of this. It's not just in, 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 in evolutionary yeah. history, but I mean, it's, it's the way we learn. We learn by having theories about stuff, and there's this ensemble yeah. of possible theories, and then you put them through an experimental test, and some survive and some don't, and so on and so on. There's, there's many ways. Yeah. So what you're saying is natural selection, which is extremely powerful, is an emergent property of the world. It only emerges that you need a certain amount of complexity before that emerges. Yeah. Um, are you saying it also has a kind of top-down causation? Natural selection? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, any, any, any adaptive selection process has a double um, top-down thing. Firstly, there's the environment in which it takes place, which um, if you change the environment, then the outcome is different. And so my favorite example is, I've got this brown bear there, and it's brown because it lives in the Canadian yeah. uh, tundra, and it, it would be white if it lived up in the... Mm -hmm. and, and so why is it white or brown? It's because the environment acts down to the level of genes, change the level of genes. Yeah. Um, but in a general adaptive selection process, the second top-down thing is the choice of the selection criteria. Yeah. And so uh, the kind of example I like is, so you've got your computers full up with emails, and so you start deleting the emails and filing them. Well, what you're doing is a process of top-down selection, and there's a selection criteria, which one goes into which, and that's how you create order out of disorder, is by adaptive selection. That makes sense. And you, and I, don't you know, I don't know if my um, email inbox has ever been ordered in any kind of <laughs> meaningful way, but hopefully. And, and the, the, classic, your selective method, the classic yeah. physics example is Maxwell's demon, and yeah. there the gate is you let yeah. through stuff which is faster than 25 kilometers a second and you keep the other stuff out and that's how you create an ordered one out of a disordered one and and select selection process is anti-entropic uh, when you look at it locally because precisely because yeah. it's creating order out of disorder so if we go back to fine-tuning again yeah so in order for there to be life it seems like we would need something like natural selection to sort the to take the information from the environment yeah. and to make it affect yeah. life and that's clearly been incredibly, that's been one of, of the really important 
principles that has allowed the kind of diversity of life around yeah. us to flourish. Um, do you think that there's a... So this sounds like it's a, such a generic principle that we'd find it almost anywhere. Yes, but it's an emergent principle. Uh, and, and this is really important that if you ask a physicist, is there any example of natural selection in physics? And the answer is not in physics per se. Yeah. Um, it's 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 an emerge it 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 emerges once you've got biology, but it, it you won't find any physics textbook which says natural selection is a law of physics. Which so I mean, one of the questions about that plays a lot in the evolutionary literature is how much of what we see is caused by, um, you know, physical law, yeah, um, and how much of it is contingent, you know, based on history, yeah. And Dorothy Thompson was a famous exponent of the physical law and explained things like the shapes of shells. You yep. know, the, the famous near Fibonacci sequences that you see in the radii of shells, these all come from physical law. Yep. And presumably, if we had a different chemistry, we would still these physical, some of these physical laws would still determine the outcomes and the shapes of the kind yep. of animals we'd see. Yep. Well, there, there's a very nice little book called Cat's Claws and Catapults, or some title a bit like that, saying if you're going to construct um, a, a, mach a claw to throw things, you have to, you, you, there's all sorts of physical constraints on what you have to do. Yeah. In all, you have to have material, you have to have certain lengths, yeah. certain strengths, otherwise you haven't got it. And the same is true for machinery and, and, and for, the, for the human body. For the, that you, you need strengths of materials, you need strengths of muscles and all sorts of stuff. And that kind of physics constrains what is biologically yeah. possible. Which is why you know, we don't have, we're limiting our size, right? Because yeah. of the scaling as we grow, well, the scaling of the size of our bones. Right? Re re regrettably, it's the reason we can't have wings. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> why is that? Well, because the, the power you would require for, for us, the, the scaling is wrong, is... is, is, is yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's one of the things which has gone wrong in evolutionary yeah. history. We should have grown wings, wings and then we could have flown around. Yeah, that would have been a lot more fun. But the scaling won't work. <laughs> So in some sense, yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, so one question would then be, so natural selection works on the variation that's given yeah. to it. Um, there are physical constraints like that are, li that are given by things like the strength of our bones, which limit our size, and a large number of other constraints of that nature, which are physical constraints. Um, and if we were to change the laws of physics, those constraints would change in one way or the other. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. The difficulty is, is that there may be a lot of surprise in how those things might change. Right? Um, and so, but almost certainly, if you were to have life on a different planet or in a different chemistry, you would still need natural selection. Oh, yes, absolutely. And natural selection probably is not a fine-tuned thing. It's a very robust phenomenon no, no, that would, re would reappear each time. I, I would be very, very happy to say that if there's life on another planet, it must have come about through natural selection. selection. Yeah. yeah. I have another, I have a, there's a thought I wanted to run by you. So, you know, we're, in physics we use stochastic methods like Monte Carlo simulations all the time. And it's very easy to prove that if you want to do a high dimensional integral, that um, as the number of dimensions grows, yeah. then the stochastic methods become much more efficient than quadrature methods. And this has to do with the errors always scale with the number of points to that one half, basically the square root. It's just statistical noise. Whereas as you increase the number of dimensions of quadrature, you have to keep putting more and more points in to get yeah. the same kind of error. So this tells us that if we want to search in high dimensional spaces, then these stochastic methods with some kind of selection criterion are the most efficient way of doing okay. so. And so it's therefore not surprising that if you want to get something as complicated as life, which is searching through a very high dimensional possibility space, that a stochastic process or a random process, so people call it, um, w with natural selection is the most efficient way of doing okay. so. Mm. Does that, does that, does that, that seems like a reasonable way of, yeah. I mean, it seems like a very strong intuition, that must be true. So therefore, if we were to change the laws of physics and have a different kind of life, it's still the case that a 
something like variation, random yeah. so, so, so interaction so I, would have to happen because that's the most efficient way and probably the only yeah. real way that you can search. These so so I, think, I think what you're saying is there are these emergent laws which are very robust and independent of the underlying physical yeah. realization. But nevertheless, that underlying physics must be restricted in certain ways. Like again, still, I don't believe that you will be able to get what's going up there unless you've got the carbon, nitrogen, yeah. oxygen, yeah. phosphorus. Um, but that's just my belief. And so if you say to me, my imagination isn't good enough, all I can say is, right, my imagination yeah, isn't good yeah, enough. No. I'm not saying your imagination isn't good enough. I'm just saying there is, a, you know, biologists um, worry about the limits of our imagination yeah. more than physicists yeah. do.